I want to make sure that we identify everybody on the call. And I'm wondering if I can go to Council President Hunt, who's probably on her computer. Um, would you be able to go around the boxes and make sure everybody introduces themselves? Because I'm not able to see everybody. If you could do that for me, that would be great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Council President Hunt, uh, Victoria Hunt, and um, I will go in the order of the boxes that I see. So. First, I have Council Member D. Michelle. Hello, I'm Council Member Barb D. Michelle. Glad to see everybody this morning. And Council Member Goodman. Uh, good morning, everyone. Council Member Stacy Goodman here. Thanks for joining us. This is always a fun time, these meetings every year. Yes. Um, Council Member Hall. Hello, hello. Zach Hall here. Good morning. It's good to see you all again. Councilmember Martz. Thanks. Hi, this is Councilmember Tolo Martz. I'm in my 12th year. Next year we'll start 13th year on council. So nice to see so many of our legislators here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. Yes. Um, Councilmember Walsh. Good morning, everybody. Representative Callan. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Representative Lisa Callan. Thank you. Senator Mullet. Mark Mullet from Issaquah. <laughs> <laughs> We're all from Issaquah. <laughs> we won't tell Maple Valley and Snoqualmie about this. <laughs> yeah. um, and then uh, Mayor Polly. Thank you. So, uh, do we also have staff with us today, Council President? Yeah, I'm just going through the order. So, we actually have a few other. Um, people as well. Excellent. Well, welcome everyone. Representative Ty. Thank you. Um, good morning. Good morning to everyone. And um, no, I'm not from Issaquah, but it's very nice to see many of you. Thank you. Um, then we have Council Member Elect Joe. Good morning, everybody. Uh, new guy on the block. Happy to be here. And we have. Um, City's lobbyist, Shelly Helder. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Um, and then we have several other uh, individuals who are not currently on camera, but um, I will just go through names and let me know if I miss anyone. So we have Andrea Snyder, Erica Boyd, um, Chief Clark, and uh, Tina Eggers. And I and Monica Negrilla on the human services for Issaquah. And let me know if I miss anyone, please. Oh, and I'm I'm sorry, I Representative Ramos. I'm sorry, I don't for some reason see you. So Representative Ramos. Yeah, I'm here. Some reason the video is not coming up, but I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Um, did I miss anyone else? We have our host, which is our city clerk Tisha Geezer as well. Thank you, Council Thank you. President Hunt. Um, again, welcome everybody. Just a few uh, uh, video meeting rules. I'm going to ask uh, our host, um, City Clerk Geezer, to keep an eye on the chat box. If you have a comment or a question, uh, you can just write the word comment or question in the box and she will let me know and we'll let you join in the conversation, which will be great. Um, to begin today's discussion, I'm going to turn this over now to Deputy Council President Chris Ray. Who is he not here today? He's not here, so you'll be turning it over to me. Oh, I'm going to turn this over to Council President Hunt. Uh, Council President Hunt. Great, thank you, thank you, Mayor Polly. Um, before we begin reviewing our priorities for the upcoming session, we first wanted to say thank you for your work on behalf of the city in the 2021 session. We are very grateful for legislators that are willing to meet with us to learn about the issues that are important to the Issaquah community and to partner with us on advocating for our priorities. So thank you, thank you for being here. And because of your support, the Issaquah Food and Clothing Bank received a million dollars for their expansion project that will help them meet the increased need for food assistance that we are seeing currently. And we were also successful in restoring the streamlined sales tax mitigation payments which were abruptly ended in 2020, 
and which exacerbated the city's financial challenges during the height of the pandemic. Passing this legislation to guarantee quarterly payments until 2026 provides the certainty that we need for budgeting and planning for the sunset of the program. And we recognize that this was a heavy lift since it only impacts a few cities, including us. So thank you. And finally, we are incredibly grateful for the $2.66 million Recreation and Conservation Office grant towards the purchase of the Bergsma property. Conservation of this land on Cougar Mountain is a community priority for all of its many community benefits. And we appreciate the state's partnership in making our conservation goals a reality. And now I will turn it back over to Mayor Polly to kick off a review of our 2022 priorities. Mayor Polly. Thank you, Council President Hunt. So we do recognize that this is a short legislative session this season, and it is a non-budget year. So we have tried to keep our priorities focused on the one area that is most pressing to our community, which is no surprise to you, it's transportation. Um, the passage of the federal infrastructure package is really good news, and we're very eager to see what that translates to into for Washington State and our region. Um, I've had the great pleasure throughout the summer of meeting with um, our 5th district representatives and our senator about uh, transportation. And I know you have been working tirelessly these last few months to try and reach an agreement on a state transportation revenue package. I cannot overstate how critical this is, not just for Issaquah, but for the entire region. And we are ready to support you in any way we can to help get a package over the finish line. Um, some may say it's not politically prudent to pass a revenue package in an even number year, um, but I want to respectfully push back on that assertion. Um, the need is too dire to wait another year and we really need to make these investments now. I'm gonna pass the virtual mic over to council member Stacy Goodman to share some more details about our first transportation priority and also just to let everybody know that this is uh, this council member's last legislative breakfast as she is retiring in December of this year. And we appreciate all the work she's done for our city through the last decade. So council member Goodman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Polly. Good morning to everybody again. Um, I'm going to be talking briefly about um, State Route 18. Um, we are continuing to partner with the communities and organizations that make up the Southeast Area Legislative Transportation Coalition, or it's more easily said as CLTC, and uh, we're asking that the state fully fund the widening of State Route 18. We are grateful for the additional $60 million that was allocated to the I-90 Highway 18 interchange project last session. And this will allow the widening component of that project to extend all the way to Deep Creek rather than ending at Raging River. This means the remaining portion that will need to be widened is roughly five miles, which is Issaquah Hobart Road to Deep Creek. The improvements needed along this stretch of highway are urgent. According to WashDOT data, on King County state routes and interstates last year, this unimproved portion of SR18 accounted for only 3% of average annual daily traffic volume but nearly 18% of deadly accidents. Widening to four full lanes with a center median will not only prevent dangerous head-on collisions, but will also provide increased capacity. Before the pandemic, eastbound traffic during morning rush hours traveled less than 45% of the posted speed limits. Westbound traffic during morning and evening rush hours traveled less than 25% of the posted speed limits. Improving the safety and reliability of this route will make SR18 a more attractive route for regional traffic and will allow commuters from south of the city to travel around rather than through Issaquah. According to the most recent WashDOT estimate, the cost to complete these improvements is $640 million. We do recognize the magnitude of this request and the limited capacity of state's transportation budget, but waiting another decade to fund this project is not an option. We really need your help and we do stand ready to support you in any way we can. And I think now we have time for some questions, if you have any. I can give brief remarks if I think the, the most recent positive update, I guess, is Mike Cotton from WashDOT let us know on November 24th that we did have a qualifying bid for the interchange project. So basically three, 
firms were submitting bids and then we didn't know until the envelopes were unsealed on November 24th. It's, I don't know, it's like a game show, I guess. And, uh, and I don't know if all three qualified, all they could tell us is that one qualified. And so we have enough to guarantee the project can go forward. And at the end of December, we will get more details of whether there's multiple winners and who's going to end up getting the contract. But there was some anxiety just with some of the increase in pricing on projects that the fear was if one of them didn't qualify, we'd have to go back and ask for more money, but that is not the case. So that's a huge positive. So at least they can get this thing under contract and start next year. Uh, and then the other big update is during the House and Senate negotiations last month, the meeting on I think it was on November 12th, we did formally agree to raise the placeholder for this project from 500 million, which did not finish it to this new estimate, which is the 640 million. And so that is the number on the Excel spreadsheet now, which was a really big deal. And, and then I think as the mayor pointed out now, it's so now the project's on the Excel spreadsheet, the right amount we're going forward next year. And now it really just comes down to it's caught up in this whole macro issue of whether we can get the big package passed, whether that's in the 22 session or the 23 session. And, and I think we have to try to push to do something in 22 and uh, and see what happens. That's fantastic. Thank you, Senator Mallet. Yes, thank you so much for that update. Really appreciate when we get updates. I think uh, I think I'm up next. You so are. Let's uh, talk about let's talk about another crossing underneath I-90. Uh, in 2019, WashDOT completed the legislatively funded Front Street Interchange Justification Report (IJR). Uh, that report identified key improvements to support traffic flow on I-90 and mobility in the region. One of the identified improvements is an additional crossing of I-90 between SR 900 and Front Street which would relieve congestion at the Front Street interchange and enhance the safety and flow of I-90. As you can see, there are only four existing crossings in Issaquah, which may seem deficient until you realize there are eight crossings of I-90 on Mercer Island, and the number of vehicles crossing I-90 in Issaquah is exponentially greater than those on Mercer Island. The city envisions an additional interstate crossing to achieve the desired outcomes from the IJR and support multimodal transportation options specifically tied into the future sound transit light rail stop, uh, such as the notional one depicted here. An undercrossing like the one in this graphic could be created by raising I-90 at a 2% grade. Such a crossing supports the needs of the city's urban growth center where denser development is targeted. Finally, here's a rep representation of the ground view of the crossing that depicts how all the different modes of transportation come together with the future light rail station. To begin the pre-design and environment documentation process for this project, we are requesting $3.4 million. Again, we recognize the limitations on the transportation budget and that this is a supplemental year, but we are hopeful that this could be included in a revenue package. Any questions? I have one. <laughs> Go ahead, Senator. The, uh, okay, is there a back of the envelope guess on what it is to raise the I-90 grade by the 2% to enable the undercrossing for the big, is it like 120? I just can't remember. I know you guys have mentioned, I think. You know, what. yeah, that's a great question, Senator. Um, what we'll do is we'll email out some information that we have in our capital improvement plan. Um, I think the last number we saw several years ago, and again, uh, it was definitely a back of the envelope. It was something like $85 million for that. But that assumes that the only that is the only component of the project. And if we talk about um, co-locating future light rail, et cetera, you know, the, that there could be many ways to, to share in, in that cost, but we will send it out to the group after. Thanks. So the rough, just to be clear, the rough idea is instead of like Mercer Island, obviously put a lid over I-90 and our proposal is the opposite is basically to put a tunnel under I-90 by raising I-90 up. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, with that, uh, the next council member to present is council member De Michelle. Uh, thank you, uh, council member Martz. Uh, and good morning, everybody. Um, as a city, we've identified our top priorities, 
which were just reviewed. Uh, we also have a policy manual which outlines the city's position on a variety of issues that are debated by the legislature and impact cities. <clears throat> One talk, topic that we've added to the policy manual this year is a statement regarding unanticipated marijuana revenues. When the citizens of Washington voted to legalize marijuana, they did so after a public outreach campaign that indicated the revenue from taxation of marijuana would go toward prevention and treatment. While this does occur, it is a small portion of the total amount received. We recognize that marijuana revenues have specific statutory distribution formulas and go towards important work. Our request is that the state portion of any unanticipated marijuana revenues be, be dedicated to youth substance abuse prevention and treatment programs administered by the state to meet the behavioral health impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I will just add that um, even though we have a healthy youth survey uh, that was given in October and the results will not be known until uh, next spring, we are hearing consistently and constantly anecdotal information about the heavy impact of the pandemic on our young people and behavioral health impacts for, for them. So um, we would urge your attention to this issue. Are there any questions? One for Comments. Shelley, I think. Or... Senator Mullet, did you have a question? Yeah, sorry. I'm not using it. I gotta use the chat thing better. Well, okay. True confession. I did get Cisco working, and I can see you all. <laughs> you can see so it. you really can just do this now. <laughs> well, and I think I mean Shelly can probably attest. I mean, it, getting the 40 million, which we had previously were supposed to be the revenue share, was that was a pretty Herculean lift in the last couple of years. And so I was extremely happy that at least we're finally kind of honoring the initial promise of what we said we would give cities for marijuana. Uh, I guess my question for Shelley is what would be considered unanticipated revenues since they update the marijuana revenue forecast periodically, like what would we be classifying as the unanticipated portion? Because it's a mind boggling amount of money now coming in and what we refer to as pots for tots. Uh, what, what is the thought process, I guess, and what, how you determine the unanticipated part? Yeah, I think because the <clears throat> the statute that dictates where money goes, where where the marijuana revenue goes, it's um it's it's very specific. I mean, you know, it goes x million goes here, x million goes there, and so the thought is that for the additional amount that's coming in, that's not part of the it's not accounted for in the statute. That rather than just being, you know leftover money that gets allocated into the existing pots that that it be dedicated to um, behavioral health needs so that um, as council member michelle said it, the money is already going there so it's not not to say that you know this is a new need but that more of marijuana revenue should be going to behavioral health treatment um, so i guess it's not necessarily I guess the reason that we made the request this way, unanticipated revenue, is because we we're not saying that we should revisit the statutory distribution of marijuana revenues. <laughs> I mean, I think that's um, that that's just everyone wants to do that, and we recognize that's not politically something that Issaquah wants to undertake. But in the event that there's decisions about what do we do with additional marijuana revenue, we think this is this is a worthwhile option. So I'm not sure if that answered the question. I, I, I hear you. Okay, my other reps too, if anybody else has a question or a comment. Oh, there we go. My representative. Thank you. I, I think it's more a a statement and I was waiting for my friend Lisa to say something. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out the platform here. Like, how do I raise my hand and do I have to? No, I'm trying Sorry. to raise my hand too. And I, I was like, you know what? I give up on technology. I just do it. Like, just do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this works. So, um, so, and, and part of the reason why I, I specifically call out my dear friend Lisa is because the both of us are working um in that area specifically and we are looking um 
at both um, short term and long term. And so um, really my comment is I like to personally thank you uh, for that uh, for that request. Uh, we uh, we look at all the revenue resources, uh, recognizing that, um, and in fact, in my conversation with um, with um, the uh, the budget writers uh, recently, th that was um, I, I, I share with them that's really my number one I then, um, my number one uh, priority um, is that we focus on mental and behavioral health support for our youngest. Um, they 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 needed uh, us the most at this point in time, and so just want to express my gratitude to to uh, the city of Issaquah for elevating the issues. Um, looking forward to work with you, and um, uh, and and you know the 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 more uh, area that we can identify as far as pouring and pushing more support for. Our kids, the better um, the outcome would be, and the sooner we can hopefully get them back to as normal as possible. So, thank you for that. Thank and you, Representative Ty. Representative Callan? Thank you. Um, so, I do uh, will echo uh, the comments from Representative Ty and appreciate her partnership and the work on the Children Youth Behavioral Health Work Group. Um, and we talk often about this, and one of our top budget provisos that we'll be moving forward is a prenatal through the age of 25 strategic plan on behavioral health so we can create a vision, a better vision for our state around a continuum of level of services that we need to have and fill in the gaps that we see. We certainly know on the state level we have a um, we have an erosion of just the foundational services of behavioral health um, as we've seen a significant uh, workforce drop and then a significant increase in need. So I think that you'll see a legislative priority across the board trying to figure out how to do kind of a crisis response to the behavioral health needs in the state, as well as um, the longer term direction of what we're talking about and you pointing out and being willing to and support this idea of um, unanticipated revenues going to support that specific area and recognizing the need for additional funding in that space. Um, I do also applaud and greatly appreciate and uh, anything specific in that way um, to your needs within the city and how we can help support your local control around meeting those needs. I would also love to hear. So keep that on the radar and happy to partner with you in that work. Thank you, Representative Callan. Um, I see um, Representative Ramos's assistant, Erica, but I don't see Representative Ramos. Are you still with us? I am here. I'll be here till 845. Okay. Whatever your system is, is just not working for me this morning. So, um, oh, dang it. it's not, it's not showing me here, but I'm here. I can, I can hear it and I can unmute and speak up. So he's, he's um, like a voice from above. There you <laughs> go. Yeah. All right. So that's great. Well, since I won't be able to see you raise your hand, you may just have to verbally say, I'd like to add a comment. That would be great. I'll interrupt as necessary and just know as again, Ron, I got to leave at 845. That is great. Thank you. Um, not seeing any other comments or questions. I believe the next person up is Council President Hunt. Thank you, Mayor. Another topic that we've added to our policy manual this year is support for updates to the Growth Management Act that align with the city's climate action plan, as outlined in House Bill 1099. The city began development of our climate action plan in spring of 2021, and we expect to adopt the final plan later this month, actually at our probably our last meeting of the year, which is next week. And the plan will provide actions and policies the city will take to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in buildings, transportation, and waste, and protect our natural areas while adapting to the impacts of climate change. House Bill 1099 directs all GMA cities to develop a similar plan and requires climate resiliency be incorporated into comprehensive plans. We support funding for cities to complete this planning work. And importantly, we ask that the state dedicate revenue to assist with implementation of mitigation actions. The Climate Commitment Act is a source of revenue for the specific purpose, and we would like to see some of that revenue dedicated for local actions. Preparing for climate change will be a huge challenge for all levels of government, including at the local level. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions on this topic. 
I am not, not I'm not seeing any. I just, I thank you, Council President, for that update. We are so excited to be one of the few cities that's adopting a climate action plan. It's amazing. Um, Senator Mellon, did you have a yeah, comment or I question? Didn't, yeah, I didn't realize you guys were adopting that this month. That's very cool. I think like you said, I think you're ahead of the curve. Uh, I think on 1099, the part of the bill that I think caused more anxiety was the part around saying you can't build in certain areas because I think of them not being like whether it's in a flood zone, et cetera. I think there was some different, I think that's the segment of the bill that is going to be the focus to try to figure out the upcoming session. I think the idea of encouraging people to follow your path, I, I would clarify as the more uncontroversial part of the bill. Mm -hmm. I think that is has broad support. I think it's really just trying to figure out how you would define and and I think there is some fear that the other part of the bill that removes areas as buildable lands in the region is the one they just want to make sure is, is done in a way that doesn't take too much inventory out of the market, I guess, or future inventory. Thank you for that clarification. I'm, one of the reasons the city is so committed to its climate action plan is that we want to make sure that we have a uh, enough focus on the natural environment that we are able to manage, you know, the changes that we're having in weather patterns and flooding and all these other changes that are coming. And so it's important to look at that land inventory and, and, and look 50 years out to make sure that we are, we are planning for that future. So thank you for letting us know about what the controversy was. Are there any other comments or questions on what council president and the climate action plan? Um, this was extremely proud to be a city that's passing that. I believe uh, next council member up is council member Walsh. Yes, thank you. So the final topic we wanted to touch on is public safety, which we know is going to be a big part of this session. So to start out, we just really want to thank you and your colleagues leadership in debating and adopting all of the package of police reform bills last session. We know this is a very challenging policy area and we're grateful for the commitment to create a more just society for everyone. Um, we've been working with our police chiefs, our legal counsel, our insurance provider to implement the policies in accordance with the new law. Um, but like many jurisdictions around the state, we've encountered some areas of ambiguity. So we understand that in the House, Representative Goodman and Representative Johnson are drafting clarifying legislation to ensure the consistent interpretation and application of the laws statewide. So clarifying that um, or clarifying that all less than lethal options are allowed and clearer guidance on the law enforcement's role in community caretaking circumstances are the two areas that would be most helpful for Issaquah in our community. Um, and then finally, while these clarifications are important, we also have to do the work as a city to improve coordination between our first responders, neighboring jurisdictions, behavioral health providers, and everyone else involved in this crisis. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mayor Polly to describe what we're doing in that area. Thank you, Council Member Walsh. Um, I just want to second everything that Lindsay has just stated and um, let you know how we appreciate the work that the legislature has done and is doing to improve public safety. In addition, I want to acknowledge that there are several members of the city's team in the audience here today, um, police, fire, and parks and community services, as we see that this is kind of, we need to have an integrated approach in how we um, do our crisis management. So as mayor, I have found myself in a challenging place because I'm hearing from citizens and residents that are concerned that public safety is not improving and is actually declining within our community. And some of this is an education challenge, um, helping folks understand the limitations of the law. And some of this is a clarification issue, which we extremely appreciate that the legislature is willing to tackle. Some of this is also a coordination issue among various government services. It's why I talked about having police, fire, parks, and community services here is we do need to have this integrated approach in crisis management. So we are in the midst of a community crisis right now, and specifically in circumstances when an individual is having a behavioral health crisis. We need a more collaborative approach that considers the myriad of scenarios that could unfold. If an individual refuses assistance, but is clearly in distress, what is our response? 
If the individual is under the influence of drugs or alcohol and wants help, what is our response? Where do we take someone who wants help? Where do we take someone who is an imminent threat to themselves, but is not breaking any law? What are the resources that already exist? What are the gaps and what do we need to do to fill those gaps? Um, at our city, we are convening a work group that includes police, Eastside Fire and Rescue, Human Services, Parks and Community Services, the hospital, neighboring jurisdictions, and designated crisis responders from the county to work through these questions and to develop a response plan. This is new for us because cities have not historically played a role in the behavioral health care continuum, but with the rise of behavioral health needs, our law enforcement and our parks and community services staff are the ones that are encountering these individuals in our community in crisis. So I'd like to take a break there um, and see if there are any questions or comments on the last two topics from council member Walsh and myself. Uh, yes. We have representative Ramos go. So yeah. Representative, uh, Representative Ramos go and then Representative Callan. Yeah, so I jump in here and, and I'm glad you're aware of what we're doing in public safety there, working with uh, Chair Goodman and Vice Chair Johnson uh, in uh, public safety leadership uh, and, and trying to get clarification on some things that have been misinterpreted um, uh, from our intent originally. So that that uh, we're working on now, we're having a number of meetings on that with, uh, with uh, you know, police groups and community groups and so forth. So that should be coming, not anticipating any new changes to the intent of legislation, just mainly the clarification part so that's clear and everybody can be working on the same definition. So that is in the works, as, as you mentioned, you know about that. So uh, uh, we'll keep on that. And that's the main thing, uh, comment I have on this. Thank you. Representative Callan. Lisa, you. <laughs> Shoot, sorry, my doc started barking, so I muted myself. Um, so I really do appreciate the ongoing conversation that we've had uh, on this topic and that we've been able to have with our, you know, our cities across the fifth on here. And certainly, I think the development of model policy that helps create the consistency, which is also the intent of the legislation across the state, I think will be very helpful. Um, you know, not having that model policy coming out at the same time as the reform, I think was. Uh, you know, we saw all of the challenges that, that people faced, but in particular, the behavioral health response and how we need to build that system out to really get to what, again, the intent of the legislation is, right? I mean, I think we're, we are seeing a shift and I appreciated the way you, you characterized it. There is change afoot. There's also clarification that's necessary and needed, and we hope to see that in this legislative session, but the coordination and the collaboration and the depth of service that's needed in the gaps of service that's needed to really support that behavioral health continuum is very real, very costly, and we need to understand how to pull that together. And um, I would love to stay kind of uh, really connected at the hip with you all and the work that you're planning on doing. I'm very excited to hear about your workforce, and that's something that I would like to see. Um, and in fact, is a, a request that's coming out from the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Work Group, specifically around schools, to try to help build a grant dollars to support school systems in figuring out how they can connect to and partner with community services and supports because of the the dearth of behavioral health supports that they have in the school systems across the state. And I think the same thing is true for the cities, and uh, for our unincorporated spaces too. So definitely working in that space. Um, I know the the. So Guami Valley is very interested in being able to replicate some of the work that you've already done. Um, we know that the Maple Valley space has already had a behavioral health navigator um, and seeded some of that fund. And so you are again leading in some of that space and trying to step forward and what that needs to happen. And I think that's exactly talking about that additional revenue, um, the unanticipated receipts, whatever we need to do to create some stabilized funding and some funding that's long-term and there to support both locally and at the state level to build out that continuum of care service of what that looks like. So as you unfold whose role and who's doing what and where the gaps are and what you think is the state's role in that, keep me very much a, you know in the middle of it and I'll try to support you the best I can. And I think you have uh, partners here in the legislature here showing up in this call anyway. For sure, um, I know the same is true for uh, Representative 
Sin and Senator Wellman to try to figure out how we can really build that out. And I think there's a clock on the, um, the legislation that was passed in response to the Blake decision. And that also is going to drive diversionary services and supports. I know in the children, youth and family space, there's uh, other bills that have clocks on them around uh, youth exiting from um, institutions or from healthcare systems into homelessness and uh, connected with juvenile justice and what is that tie. So all of these pieces play in together and how we can build and structure a better system of response. And the 988 crisis line, of course, is really a huge element that ties and connects all of this. So making sure that we've got local voice that's really showing up in the advisory committees that are supporting the development of the 988 line and all of those supports behind it and how you interface and connect not only as a city to the designated crisis response team and the 988 structure, but also to all the places where people show up with the behavioral health crisis, which includes our schools. And our, you know, and, 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 right? So thanks, you know, this is my passion area. So thanks for letting me spew here for a minute. <laughs> I'll make one. I do think, obviously, I think the whole economy is going through staffing challenges. Uh, obviously, I, police is no different than that. I think that the upcoming session, we do have to make, I don't know, I think we have to find a way so police officers in our state feel like they are really genuinely appreciated and valued. And, and I think one proposal, I guess this will be pertinent to Chief Clark on the line is we are looking, my role on the state investment board, the left too is the best funded pension account. And there is discussion this upcoming session of enhancing the left two benefits in the pension space. I mean, basically to go into the weeds of it, years 15 to 25, you could get an extra half percent, you know, normally it's 2% times years of service. They would potentially add on an extra half percent for years. 15 through 25, it would be a fairly substantial, it would be a $600 million benefit enhancement. I think that I am pushing for this proposal as a way for the legislature to show people on the ground doing public safety that they are valued. And I don't know, Chief Clark, if, is that, is that pr proposal filtered down to your level as a possibility in the upcoming session and how involved you've been? It, it certainly has filtered down during last session when some when it started getting some steam uh, and folks are looking forward to it. And I would say that's probably the number one thing you could do uh, to show appreciation since that fund is so well funded. Um, if you were, I would encourage the those that are pushing it to, to get it public, um, like some of the things that happened negatively last year, it would be nice to get some positive um, information going out like that, and I'll certainly disseminate it, but uh, that would go a long way. Well, I'm gonna go on record that I think we can get it to the finish line, even though it's a short session. It's not a general fund hit, it comes out of the left two account, and I'm in the weeds of that account, and I feel pretty confident that we could afford it, and given it would be a really strong message to public safety folks in our state that they are appreciated. And I think that in combination with a lot of clarification, the last thing we want is like AWC insurance policy to be telling our officers, like, you can't intervene here. It's like, we've screwed up as a legislature when people are interpreting, interpreting what we did with that much ambiguity that they're giving bad advice to the cities. And it's on us to really clarify that beyond any shadow of a doubt. So that's not happening again after the 22 sessions finished, hopefully. Thank you, Senator Mellon. It's been difficult. It's been difficult for our EMTs. It's been difficult for our police officers. And thank you for bringing up that uh, conversation. I see uh, Representative uh, Ty has a hand up. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor. I I wanted to jump into this conversation as well. There's four of us um, on this, and this was a, um, I I would say th I voted yes. Um, for this string of reformed and um, I, I concur with my uh, colleague as far as really applauding um, your willingness to collaborate and work with us. The most difficult things, um, at least for me as a, well, I can't say it because Lisa and I come in in the same year, so I can't call myself newbie anymore. Uh, anyway, for the last three years, this is what I learned. 
I learned that the more we have conversation together, especially on legislations that are as complex as this one, we're talking about not only changing system, we're changing culture. And culture is really led by people mindset. And people mindset, if anything I learned from my four year college, is that a human like habit. Um, we create certain habits and we stuck with it and we feel comfortable in it. We feel we feel like anytime there's any change in that space, whether it's a whether it's a habit, like whether you have your you have you have your cup of coffee in the morning before you can do anything, and without it, you kind of like, oh my God, like the work is coming like to an end. Um, yet at the same time, for the legislative work, it is about looking at system wide and ask ourselves what we've done. Uh, or what done, I can't say what we've done because I was not in that part of the system before, but what done did not provide public safety for all of our people. And we have moved into the space where we actually asked who feels safe and who don't. And the role of a legislator like myself, uh, representing the people who rarely have a seat at the table, is to speak up of why I didn't feel safe or the people look like myself didn't feel safe and how do we really better our system so that everyone gets to feel safe because each one of you, I hope, agree, do our work or sign our name on a piece of paper saying that we commit to the work for our public. And so if it is about the intent that wasn't clearly articulated or it's a particular campaign to misinformed, we are committed to continue to have conversations. What we're hoping is that we need to start at the place where we want to do this work to build trust. We do not start the place where we want to do this, this work so that we punish anyone. So as a member of a uh, marginalized and people of color community, we understand what it felt like to not belong, what it felt like to be punished for something for a long time, simply because of the skin color. So the last thing we want at least for myself, I will simply speak for myself, is to punish anyone. It is about creating a space of trust. And so what I'm hoping and asking cities and elected officials to really have conversation with us, to really pay attention to some of the work we're doing, because we are not any better than you. Again, I'm speaking for myself. I should say, I am not any better than you. I, I lacked knowledge especially grassroots knowledge of the work that you are doing. And so having a partner like you yourself in this work telling me how do you impact. And when you look at a piece of legislation, I hope that would you would be a partner in helping shape the change of the habit that somehow we're so comfortable in, leaving so many people feeling vulnerable so that all of us can feel safe, not just some of us. So I just want to make sure that piece of clarifications being in the space. And I am first and foremost, absolutely appreciating all the officers who are working to keep the public safety in check and definitely um, support uh, mental health and behavioral health for all of our member. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Tai. Um, I, I wanted to just add a couple of comments there. I am I am so proud of our public safety team and they are extremely supportive of the work that you're doing at the legislature. Our goal is to make sure that when we come upon a person in crisis, we have something to do. And normally the city's role is we're the we're the we're the first point of contact that they may have. And so we will definitely as we go through our work on crisis response. Um, come back and let you all know where we see gaps, where we have approached a person in crisis and we're unable to provide any resources because cities don't 
you know, we don't have a tax based system that allows us to do much more than to be the 1st responder and that 1st point of contact. And we know that there is more that needs to be invested in mental behavioral health addiction services, all of that. So we hope to be able to provide you some very useful information as we work our way through our process. So, thank you. We are coming up close to the end of our time, but I do want to uh, sort of have a quick little go around with the representatives and senators that are still here on any issues that you may want to talk to us about that you're working on in the legislature that we haven't heard about yet. And I also just want to let you know that we are a very, very active city in order. We are supportive of the work you're doing. We will show up. We will testify. And so we, we have your backs and you should know that. So let's uh, maybe close out this morning by going around the room and um, Representative Callan, if you'd like to start, is there anything else that we didn't talk about today that you'd like to let the city council know you're working on? Well, I greatly appreciate that. And before um, I do anything else, I do want to thank uh, Councilman Goodman for her extensive service and all of the, the significant um, value that you brought in really affecting the lives of all of the 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 residents of Issaquah and uh, just I'm deeply grateful for you and for the service and your time and um, I hope you don't go far in the, the work and you stay close and you keep us all accountable because your voice is, um, is transformative and makes a difference. Um, well, I live, I live on the next block over so I know where you are. <laughs> no, we can come knock on my door anytime. Absolutely. Um, so the other areas that I'll be working on besides the behavioral health space, which you saw my passion come through on, um, is certainly doing all of the, the the background support on the transportation agendas that you guys have laid out. Um, certainly want to continue to push in all of that direction on what is uh, really the take home needs for our legislative district. And then, of course, um, in my education space, working to help support our school districts through um, what is yet to be still their most challenging year in the pandemic and what is happening there in their funding uh, challenges as well as just, you know, the, the uh, health care um, aspects of what they're doing and the recovery around the pandemic and that there's going to be some long term implications there. So there's a lot of work that's happening there just on a high level. So if there's any intersection there and partnership that is coming in from the city, I would love to hear about that and learn about that as well. That was great. Thank you. And in if you don't have the chat open, Representative Ramos has uh, left for the day. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Representative Pai and then to Senator Mullet to close this out. Thank you. And I, I too, um, um, wanted to uh, extend my gratitude to your active work uh, from the city of Issaquah um, in in uh, supporting our legislative uh, areas of, of making change, hopefully for the better of, of many. Um, yes, besides the mental behavioral health, um, which I'm working with Rosalind Callan, um, I am, uh, this upcoming sessions, I, uh, I found myself having uh, quite a few legislations in the healthcare area. Um, no surprise, we're still in the health crisis. <laughs> So, uh, working to really uh, improving the healthcare system, and for me, it is continue to be uh, looking deeply at the the population who currently do not have any healthcare coverage. Um, and uh, if there's one, if there's one thing um, to say about uh, COVID nineteen, this pandemic, um, it's it's sort of like the the one the one testimonial we needed at every single public hearing, and I do not wish for this pandemic to last any longer, but I'm just saying that this testimonial just keep coming and coming and coming and showing us that the lack of how our healthcare system, you can see I'm kind of like getting to that zone of like, oh my God, I'm so mad. <laughs> like we don't have the healthcare system that provides services and support. For everyone, considering our nation is the leaders um, of everything in the world, which kind of sad. Uh, so housing is not our, my number one issues. This, uh, I'm sorry, healthcare is my number one issues. Second part is housing, and last but not least, I'm bringing back House Bill 1202. And I understand that uh, the CD uh, are really concerned about it, and so I love to hear 
and being able to answer your question directly because I understand um, how you are as a member of um, the, uh, the CD association as a whole across the state uh, in oppositions of House Bill 1242. And so I want to clarify if, if there's any questions or concern uh, because it's once again, um, I, I'd like to see the accountability being uh, being lifted up as as why we do this work and who should be accountable for. And so uh, those are the sort of like the the area where I, I would spend my energy and time on. Once again, thank you Pai, for would you give the council a, a couple sentence uh, on House Bill 1202 and what the primary purpose of it is? I'm not sure everybody's tracking that one. Oh, yes, thank you. So House Bill 1202 is titled Peace Officer Accountability Act. Uh, it is to create uh, a civil cause of action um, in Washington state, uh, which uh, when a peace officer uh, violate an individual's constitutional rights, the families and victims uh, may bring forward a civil cause of action, uh, which is a civil lawsuit in Washington state. Uh, this particular legislation, my intent is to put accountability and yes, liability on the entities that have the power in policies. And those entities are the cities, the county and the state. We are the entities that have power to change policies, to allocate funding for our police, to ensure that our police get appropriate and adequate training. And all, and, and did I say adopt policy? I'm gonna say it once again. We are the entity that's had the power to adopt and change policies at the policy level. If we don't, we need to be accounted at be accounted for, and that include the state. And so um, that is House Bill 1202. It is an accountability bill uh, that if city, county, and state do not put in funding for training, do not do not adopt policies, which lead to pro protocols and procedures at the staff, police department included level, uh, then we need to be accountable for the violations of individuals' constitutional rights in Washington State. Thank you, Representative Tai. I'm going to quick and thank you, Erica, for putting in Representative Ramos's work uh, in the chat. Representative Ramos is working on a myriad of transportation adjacent things, some within the transpo package and some that might run as separate bills that we'll file just in case, such as the CRAB slash TIB reforms, a local options bill, and the recruitment, training, and retention of diverse workforces in WashDOT, Washington State Ferries, and DNR. He is also working with DOL and other stakeholders are making some changes to the temporary license plates, and he got that as an idea from a local resident. Uh, and uh, Lisa, Representative Callan is going to run to another meeting. And if we could keep Senator Mullet just for a minute or two, would you, is there anything else you want to let us know before we wrap up today? Well, I'll just mention like the super, I guess, hyper local stuff. Uh, I think Rep Callan, Ramos and myself are all working on something for Leo organization. Like they're kind of getting screwed where they're now being told they have to pay property tax on their buildings. And so, we're really trying to do a very narrow clarification in the law that says group homes, adult, but not all adult family homes, but for developmentally disabled, they would qualify as, you know, even though it's not a nonprofit running the business, it could be a private entity running the business, they still would qualify for the nonprofit exemption if the nonprofit purchased the, you know, subsidized the building. And so hopefully we get that to the finish line and we did have fire in the area bring up the idea during the heat wave last summer that they went to a lot of adult family homes where they saw basically people dying from heat in adult family homes who didn't have air conditioning and so we're trying to figure out whether it's a grant program whether it's a law change but how in the hell do you get adult family homes in the state to make sure they have air conditioning going forward it's not as easy as it sounds to solve i thought this would be a 
a really simple bill. It's as I've studied it for the last six months, it's more complicated, but those are just a couple that came out of things that were raised locally, you know, from June till now that, that I am optimistic we can make progress on. And, and I think we're gonna have to find a way to get vehicle sales tax into the transportation budget because the ferry system's imploding. And I think, you know, that's one of the changes we could make in the upcoming session is having a much more holistic view of our budgets so we can make some good transportation investments with or without a transportation package uh, in the upcoming session. And that's the conclusion. And, that is super you know, hyper local. Thank you, Senator Mullet. And Leo is life enrichment options. And I had heard about their issue with property taxes. So I am thrilled to hear that that's something you think might be able to be remedied in this session. That's fantastic. And the air conditioning is also an issue that I had heard about this summer as well. So those are excellent. Excellent things for Issaquah. Thank you for doing that. So we are a few minutes over time and I just want to thank everybody for staying and also again, just to um, let our representatives know that we are here to help during this session. We are a city that's very active and tracks what's going on at the state level and we're here to help and uh, let us know when we can dialogue and we'll be there for you. So thank you so much for all coming this morning. Have a great day. Take care. Everyone. Every time I go to State Park, Stacey, I'll think of all your good work. <laughs> Bye -bye. Awesome. But I think it's about your work. But <laughs> okay, take care. Thanks. Bye. See you soon. Bye bye.